Today we're going to start a new series that we've entitled Fivefold Prayer. Amen. And I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version this morning. When you all have it, will you guys shout a big amen? Amen. <clears throat> amen. I think this slide doesn't have it yet. Amen. One person on this side has it yet? Amen. amen. Okay. <laughs> we read in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> We've titled this series, Fivefold Prayer. And in the text that we just uh, read, a lot of people commonly um, address it or name it as the Lord's Prayer. But in fact, it's really more the model prayer. Because if you look in um, the book of John, that's where you find Jesus, our Lord, praying his greatest priestly prayer and that's the one that we in john 17 and that's the one we we call the lord's prayer so the text that we just read today it's our model prayer it's the model that jesus left for us to follow now this prayer this model prayer it has been an enormous benefit to multitudes to men and women to boys and girls um it's one of the first I believe it's the first prayer that parents teach their children that we as believers, it's the first prayer that we learned to recite and to, to pray. Um, it's been repeated millions and millions and millions of times by countless numbers of human beings. I mean, it's been going on for over 20 centuries. And yet, in spite of so much use, in spite of so much repetition, in spite, in spite of how much it is known worldwide, this prayer, it has never, ever lost its luster. It has always been enriching. It has always been fulfilling. It has always brought us peace. Obviously, if you're praying it, right? I mean, if you're just reciting it, it's just something else you're saying. But when you pray this prayer and you understand what it is modeling for us, what it is teaching us, what it is showing us, oh, it's going to be a blessing to you. So today we're going to look at the first segment of this prayer. And in so doing, we sh we're going to recognize that the first part of this prayer, it's a prayer of reverence. So today's sub subtopic, it's going to be reverence. It says, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This part, it's a prayer of reverence. Now, this is a prayer of reverence because initially it gives recognition. It gives recognition to whom we are praying. Who are we praying to? It tells us who we're praying to. Therefore, because of who we're praying to, because the one of the who we are addressing, because it is God Himself that we are coming before and addressing, then the very essence of this prayer demands reverence from you and from me. Because to whom we are praying, we are praying to God Almighty. We are praying to our Lord, to our Savior. And because we're addressing this prayer to Him, it's a prayer of reverence. The first sentence of this prayer tells us at least three things about God. In the very first sentence, first of all, it tells us about God's heart. You're like, where does it talk about God's heart? 
when it says our father. He is telling us that he has the heart of a father to us. When we address him as our father, he's saying, my heart towards you is that of a father. It also tells us about the habitation of God. It says, our father that are in heaven. He is telling us where he is at in that moment when we address him. Then it tells us about his, the holiness of God. It says, our father that art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We are to reverence God when we approach him in our prayers. So let's talk about the heart of God a bit. Christianity introduced into the world the concept of one God and one God alone. I don't know if you know a little bit about history, but way back when, ancient times, a lot of people had um, the idea or the thought or the practice of worshiping many gods. And um, I don't know if you guys have ever read that story in, in, our, in the Bible where Paul, he travels to Athens and he found that there they had a different God for every single day. They had a different God for every single season. They had a different God for every experience of life. And in case they missed a God that they didn't mention, they had a God that was unknown, to the unknown God. They were trying to cover all their bases. And we read that, and Paul said in Acts 17, 23, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. You see, it was the belief of the Greeks <clears throat> that even the streams and rivers and the trees and the valleys and the hills and the mountains, all of it, all of nature's forces, it was like its own God. They would worship a tree. They would worship a mountain. They would worship a hill. They would worship a river. They believed that all these objects were gods themselves, I guess like little gods. In Africa, there is also... Um, uh, people used to also believe that the python, that big old snake that you find in Africa, thank God they're not here. I don't, at least I don't think they are, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think they're here. Okay. They used to think that wherever this giant snake, this python, would crawl on the earth, a river would form there, therefore becoming a god. So as you can see, people would live their lives and in this world praying and, 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 and crying out to all sorts of gods. Now they were also convinced that gods were jealous gods, that gods were grudging, that they were hostile, that they had something against mankind. It's not like the thought that we have that we have a God in heaven that loves us to send his son to die for us. No, back then people used to think that gods were up there and that they would cause bad things to happen. For example, there was a Greek god legend. I'm going to say his name once because I don't know if I could keep saying it. His name was Prometheus. So Prometheus was a god. And he was known that it was said that before men possessed fire, before they knew how to build fires and start fires, that life was very difficult here on earth. But Prometheus... He took it upon himself. He felt sorry for men, and then he decided to give them the gift of fire. Then Zeus, you guys, I'm talking Greek mythology here, okay? I'm not talking Bible. I'm talking Greek mythology, history of what people used to think. So then Zeus got angry with Prometheus for helping mankind. So it says that he was banished or punished for helping man where he was tied to an island of some sorts in the middle of some body of water where he would be he would have to deal with the heat of the sun and his thirst in the daytime and then the cold and the chills at night and every single day he would lose his liver because birds would come in tear out his liver and then it would grow back, and then the next day they'd come back and tear it out. 
So as you can see, all of these myths. But this is how people used to think. This is what people believed back then. They needed, they needed to, uh, to, to feel, they needed to feel like there was something out there, something greater. So in their ways, they came up with all of these gods. So the whole idea that gods are jealous, that they're vengeful, that they're grudging, that, that they weren't willing to help men, that haunted men. That feared them. It, it, they, they were afraid. So now, the thought is presented. Jesus is here now, and he's saying, when you pray, you're to call your God Father. Now, you can understand why back then that would have like been like, what do you mean I can call him Father? What do you mean he loves me? What do you mean he has a heart that desires me to be his son or daughter? But that is the heart of the God that we serve. He is the God, the only God. He is God Almighty, and he is to be reverenced, but he has a heart of a father. He wants to be your father. He wants to be there for you, and he wants you to acknowledge him as your father. Now, I, I, I saw this movie once um, about a man who had fallen in love and he wanted to get married with this woman who had children, but he didn't have a father growing up. His mom passed away when he was eight and then his dad left the same time that his mom passed away. So he went into foster homes, foster homes to foster homes to foster homes. So his concept of a father was someone that abandoned him. His concept of a father was someone that didn't love him, that didn't care about him, that just uh, that wasn't there for him. So when I was watching this movie, this man, he had to come to terms when he gave his life to Christ. And his mentor, his pastor, was teaching him to pray and taught him this, this, this passage. And he says, when you pray, say our, my father, our father. Now you can see why it would be difficult. But I'm here to tell you that our father that is in heaven has a heart that loves you so. He is not like any earthly father. He is not like any other God. You can see his heart. His only son was sent to die, to be sacrificed for you and for me. Tell me that is not the love of a father that wants to save you, that wants to rescue, that wants you to be a part of his life. We have so many people that have a hard time understanding God's heart. But let me tell you, God's heart is the one that doesn't give up on us. God's heart is the one <clears throat> that although we fall every day, he lifts us right back up. Our Father's heart is the one that says, I've given it all for you. That every single morning, I give you new mercies. Do you know what new mercies in the morning mean? That means when you open up your eyes, that means he's given you life another day. That means he's given you breath and everything you need to live. That means he's given you a new slate to start all over because his mercy covers you. That means he offers forgiveness once again. So when we pray in reverence, recognize his heart. Recognize who he is. He is our father. He is your father. And he loves you like a father. And I know somebody here needs to hear it again. He is your father, and he loves you like a son, like a daughter. Yes, he is your father. And I know a lot of us struggle with it. I love my father. He lives in Thailand. He left when I was 13 years old. 
I could have used a father close by, but he was halfway around the world. So back then, just a phone call was difficult. Because back then, when you would use a landline, you would have to call the country, and they would have, we had operators, and they would answer the telephone, and then you had to speak to them and give them the number you were trying to call, and then they would connect you to the number. And what happened back then was that the operator spoke Thai. I spoke English and I spoke Spanish. I did not speak Thai. So I used to try to my best to say, yes, can I please call this number? I want to speak to my father. <laughs> and um, I would be on the phone trying to, trying to sound Thai, trying to make myself, un I knew how to say it, I just wasn't saying it properly. And it was very hard. So I spent many years without being able to communicate with my father and only handful of times when he called us that created a void in me that created insecurities in me complexes in me it made me feel that i did something wrong that i wasn't good enough because he wouldn't have left if i had been right if i had been good enough if i had been a son because in the Asian country, at least in my father's culture, it's a big deal to have a son. And I was his firstborn of the marriage, and then my brother was the younger one. So I grew up feeling very inadequate, that I was never able to please my father. But I knew that I had a heavenly father. I knew that God was my father, and I ran to him. And I never left God, in spite of how I was feeling, in spite of the hurt, I never left him. And you know what I did? I never stopped trying to seek my father. I finally got to see him once when I was 19 years old. We got to go there for three weeks. And I treated him, and I felt like I was that little girl that he left behind. Then years went back by, I got married, and nine, I was 19 when I saw him, so that must have been like 1990, 1989, 1980, no, 1990 maybe, right? <laughs> I didn't get to see him again until 2006, so many years without seeing him again. So I understand the need to feel like you have a father a physical father here on earth. But I will tell you one thing that I have learned. Having that heavenly father is much greater. And I say it with all due respect to my father, I love him dearly. But having my heavenly father always, every day with me, never leaving me alone, it's, there's nothing like it. There is nothing like it. You have a heavenly father. You have a heavenly father that you could call him father. You know that some people, when they pray, they say, oh God, oh Lord, dear God, or there's nothing wrong with that. But can you get yourself to the place where you can say, my father? Can you get to that place in your prayer when you say, my father? because we know his heart. A true prayer begins when I claim my relationship to him. Your prayer begins when you can claim your relationship to him. You are his son, you are his daughter. Claim it. Become conscious of the responsibility which arises out of it, the heart of God. What about the habitation of God? Verse 9 tells us that he is in heaven. Where is heaven? Where is heaven? Is it a place? Is it a condition of life? Is it a state of mind? Is it a different dimension of living? Is it far away or is it close by? The current translation of this verse, our Father, which 
art in heavens. And in the scripture, heaven is used to describe three distinct and different realms. In the first place, heaven is described as the earth's atmosphere. It's used to describe that space of air, that envelope of air that surrounds the planet, the conditions, our climate, you know, when it, whatever sustains our life, the formation of clouds, the precipitation of rain or hail or snow, the water vapor that provides moisture, that provides dew and frost. All of those are regards as coming from heaven. Listen to the word of God in Isaiah 55:10. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. It tells us right there that rain comes down from heaven. So there's a space that we look at that we identify in the clouds in that gap in that space as heaven. So there is this near heaven where the birds fly and where we could see the clouds, if it's going to be a cloudy day or a sunny day. That's one realm of heaven. A second realm, there is a very much broader sense of the word heaven or heavens, and it's used to describe outer space. It specifically refers to the suns, the moons, the stars, the sky, the galaxy. It denotes the unmeasurable, the immensity, the numberless galaxies that have been expanded across. For example, Psalm 19 says, the Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his work, his handiwork. So there's another realm that the Bible teaches us the galaxies, the stars, the moon, the sun. And finally, there is a third heaven referred to throughout the New Testament as the realm of God. It is sometimes described as a definite place, a heavenly country, a new Jerusalem, a home prepared for you and for me. And Paul wrote of a man who had been taken up into this third heaven, who declined to speak of the things he saw there. So there has been real bewilderment in the minds of people about heaven. But the word of God says that our Father is in heaven. So does this mean he can be in the earth's atmosphere? Yes. Does it mean that he is occupying outer space? Yes. Does, it, does he inhabit the third heaven where things can't be described where men can just not describe it. Yes. He, in his glory, away from a place of conflict, away from any stress, away from the common life, in the place of authority, in the place of peace, in the place of truth. Oh, he is in all those places. But he is also closer than your hands and your feet. He is nearer than breathing. In fact, he is so big that the heavens of the heavens cannot contain him. And yet he is, so sm he is small enough to live in our hearts. Do you understand the magnitude of our God, of our Father? He is so great. He lives in heaven. He is so great. He lives in each and every one of our hearts. He is with you. He knows what you go through. He sees you. His son is at his right hand interceding for you and for me. You know, all those times you make mistakes, all those times you fail, all those times you feel guilty and ashamed, and you don't even know how you're going to come to church, you don't even know how you're going to come and pray, you don't even know how you're going to do things, you feel so dirty, so guilty. Do you know that Jesus is up there interceding for you and covering you? 
And when our holy God looks down, oh, he sees you covered with the blood of Jesus. He sees someone that has been redeemed. He is everywhere. He is present. He makes himself apparent. He reveals himself to us. I don't know about you, but I feel him. I know when he is speaking to me. I know when he is nudging me. I know when he is pushing me. Our Father that is in heaven, guess what? He reigns in our hearts. He reigns in our hearts. Now let's talk a little bit about the holiness of God. It says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I saw a little meme the other day, or a little video on social media, <laughs> where the little boy tells the mom, I know God's name is Howard. Have you guys seen that one? And you go, what do you mean God's name is Howard? Yeah, God's name is Howard. I'm like, where do you get that from? Our Father that are in heaven, Howard be thy name. And he's like, he thought his name was Howard. But no. <laughs> God our Father, it says, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed is part of a Greek verb. I'm going to mess this one up too. I did not study Greek. If anybody knows how to say this, please help me. Hagi vestai? No? Anybody? <laughs> Huh? That's good? Hagi vestai is the Greek word that's connected with the adjective hagios, and it means to treat a person or a thing as holy. So the basic meaning of, of hagios means different or separate, something that's holy, something that is different. In things which are hagios is different from other things. A person that is hagios is separate than from other people. A sanctuary that is hagios is separate or different from other buildings. God's day, this day, Sunday, is hagios because it is different from other days. This is the Lord's day. This is where his children gather to worship him. A pastor, a minister is hagios because he is separated from other men. So in this prayer, it says, let God, God's name be treated different from any other name. Let's God, let God's names be given in a position where he is unique. So when you pray, hallowed be thy name, means his name, who he is is separate, it's holy, it is different. In Revelation 4, we've been studying this. It's a part of our theme. We are given a very dramatic and moving description of what happens around God's throne in heaven. Verse 8 says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they ceased not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. Our Father that is in heaven is a holy God. The sad truth, however, is that in today, Americans, to say that because we all live here in this country, we lack the sense of reverence. Our conversations are trivial. Our prayers become in vain. Our worship is a pretense. Our lives lived on a, they're lived very superficially. We have lost the sense of reverence. And whenever our Heavenly Father's name is not held high, our faith loses its impact and power upon our lives. You see, when you pray, it's not when you come to church and you kneel down and pray. It's not when you just have a devotional time at home. It's not when you go into your tent and pray to God. Your prayer to God 
should be continuous. The Bible says that we are to pray without ceasing. How do we pray without ceasing? Does that mean we got to be in our little closet day in and day out 24-7 and not do anything else? No. That means your life is a constant prayer. That means your actions are a constant prayer. Every conversation you have is a prayer to God because he is in you. He dwells in you. And you know that his name is holy. You know that he is a holy God. So everything you do should be a prayer. In the car, you should be praying. On the way to work, you should be praying. When you're in the middle of work, you should be praying. And everything you do should separate him from everything else. How do you do that? You reverence his name. You don't say curse words with the mouth that you say hallelujah. Amen. You know how many people, it be, it's become like second nature to beep and beep and beep curse words out like nothing. Oh, but there's nothing wrong with curse words. It's like a, it's common. People use it. No. If I'm saying glory be to God, and then my friend comes over and starts talking to me, and then I'm like, oh, yeah, did you hear that, 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 that? And how does that, how does that work? If God's name, if he is in heaven and his heart is of a father and he's done so much for you, hallowed be thy name. Give him reverence. Give him the holiness that he deserves, that he is. Watch your conversations, your actions, your attitudes. To people at work, to people at school, to people in your house, to your neighbors, do your friends know that you're a believer because there's something different about you? Because if God lives in you and he is holy and you're going to reverence him, your actions have to revere him, have to demonstrate that he is in you. Young people, are you living a holy life? I get it. You guys are young. I know our hormones are raging. I know that we want to be loved. I know that we want to find that perfect guy, that perfect girl. We want a man of God. We want a woman of God. But we become desperate in our relationships. And you guys, and we're so young. You're so young. Do you know that people at the age of 18, 18, if they don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they think that they're going to be left behind. They think they're going to be, you, Puerto Ricans call them um, jamonas or jamon. I don't know, what, like something like that. A jamon. Is it work for a boy and a girl, right? Se quedó jamon o se quedó jamona, like, right? Something like that. I don't know how to translate that into English. I, I know ham. <laughs> so I guess, but people think that if they don't have someone at a very young age, they've been destitute. They're never going to find someone. So the first person that comes along, sure, you can, you can hold my hand. I just met you like yesterday, but yeah, let's hold hands. A week has gone by. We should be French kissing by now. I'm going to be up blunt. People still say French kissing. We should be tonguing. I don't know how you guys call it now. <laughs> no. <laughs> Edit that. <laughs> okay, you just met a week ago, but you guys are down each other's throats. What is going to happen at the month point? What happens after a month? Think about it. I, I might sound funny, but I'm totally serious. At a month, hands have gone where they don't belong. Clothes have come off when they shouldn't have. <laughs> you guys are back there. It's true. Our actions, our attitudes, what happened to our Father that are in heaven? Hallow be thy name. The God, the creator of everything that is, has control of everything. You don't think he can find you the right man, the right woman, and you don't have to sell yourself cheap? 
You can't trust that he has that perfect person for you. Wait upon the Lord. He has given you self-control. He has not left you alone. You don't have to be the same as everyone else. And on a side note, if you've been there and you've done that, it's not too late. It's not the end. Because this morning, God gave you brand new mercies. This morning, God gave you new life. This morning, he's saying, I'm here to cover you. You don't have to live that kind of life. You don't have to be that way. We need to go back to living a life that reverences God, not just in our churches. Not just when people see us, but when we're alone in our rooms. And I'm being led to talk about this. Men and women, when you're alone, are you reverencing God? You may be married and you may be single, but when you're alone in your rooms or in your house, are you reverencing God and his holiness? Or are you on the computer looking at things that you shouldn't be looking at? Or are you speaking to people and doing things that you shouldn't be doing? It's not just the young folk. reverence. He is holy. He is our father and loves us, but he is still holy. We need to live a life that reverences him in all that we do. In all that we do. First Peter 1 15 and 16 says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. God is calling this church, step it up. No more playing around, let's be holy. Let's reverence God with all of our lives. Let's draw close to him knowing that he is our father and you can come to him with anything there is nothing that you can't talk to your father about because he is not like an earthly father that's going to get scandalized or that's going to get upset he is not like an earthly father that will not know what to do nothing will surprise him you can come to him and tell him whatever you want you can tell him however you feel He's not only in heaven preparing a place for us, he's in your heart and he's working in there. He's working in all of us to take us to that place where I can be holy, where you can be holy. Can we all stand?